in fundamentally the same thing. They believe that using the bully force that they have can solve problems, not make them worse. They really believe that. Some of them really, really believe that in, their, in that space where their heart should exist. <laughs> Second, it's going on record and beginning a conversation or a dialogue with others. It's going out there and stating something that puts you a little bit of risk to say, this is where I'm at. But it's not physical risk. It's not risk of property or anything. It's risk of it's social risk. Standing up and saying, here's where I'm at. And these are my moral reasons for being it. Because three, that will begin to attract others to you, and it will allow you to have a dialogue with, uh, with some still others who need to be persuaded. We can deny consent to things on a piece-by-piece basis, but withdrawing allegiance, which is the next step, is when we begin to notice, as Jefferson pointed out, that there's a pattern here. And we no longer can support this institution overall. We kind of deny consent to it as it, exi- as it exists. And say that something fundamentally, not reform, but something fundamental has to be changed. The problem has become too big to simply reform. Let me put this another way. Imagine what could happen if everyone agreed with you. Every tactic you could think of would work. You could pressure Congress into submission. You could even elect a new Congress, or you could lead a successful tax strike if that's what was required. But tactics aren't really what matters. What's common to all three of those things is that people agree with you. Enough of them agree with you. If you work your way back from the end state of complete agreement, the starting point is entirely yours, mental. Do I deny consent or go I further? Do I withdraw allegiance? Do I tell others I feel this way, or do I stand silent? Am I a bystander while the crime is going on? I'm going to give you some specific tactics, but I want to bring in somebody uh, to have this conversation with me who is further along this path than I am and has been something of a mentor even in it. We've been friends for a long time. He's the co-host of the nationally successful show Free Talk Live. His name is Ian Freeman. Ian, welcome to the Gary Nolan Show. Hey, Jim. Great to be on with you. Good. And I can almost hear you. (laughs) Oh. Okay. Uh, so I, I want to talk about this notion of denying consent because you guys have kind of gone to, to uh, a great point. Uh, you've been a follower and, and a subscriber to Downside DC for years. You know kind of what we're doing with the Zero Aggression Project, both of things that I'm, I want to discuss. But I was very impressed with something you shared with me a couple of weeks ago, and this is actually several months old, uh, the Shire Society Declaration. Um, tell, me, tell the audience a little bit about the Shire Society Declaration. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, Shire Society Declaration, let me see if I can get you uh, some better audio here as well. But the Shire Society Declaration uh, is something that a bunch of individuals have signed declaring their own personal independence. And it is something that people uh, actually signed in person back in 2010 when we revealed the declaration at the Porcupine Freedom Festival in northern New Hampshire. Uh, there were probably at least sixty people that put their names to the to the the actual document we had it uh, we had it made a, made up on a hemp paper uh, we had it you know calligraphied it was very very nice looking uh, you know parchment and uh, it was like this big deal people were declaring their independence and then uh, of course we put it online at shiresociety dot com you can read it there and you can add your own digital signature uh, to it as well by simply leaving your name. Uh, in the comment section of the website, or you can print it out uh, and sign it yourself and frame it or store it or do whatever you you want with it. It's your your personal declaration. We're not collecting anybody's uh, names or information or or files. So that's not our intention. Yes, you can publicly state it or you can privately uh, sign it. It's up to you. And and this has a lot to do with with New Hampshire. That's why you guys are calling it the Shire. Um, but there's there's some points in here, and I I would like to kind of cover each of these kind of individually. Um, sure. You could, because I think all of them are philosophically really important. We've spent most of this broadcast, so that you know, talking about the problem. And we've kind of danced around the solution a bit. But I want to talk more about kind of the fundamental philosophy that should be undergirding what we're doing, how we're supposed to view each other as human beings. And so this starts off saying that, that uh, no form of political governments may be relied on to secure the individual rights of life, liberty, or property. Yeah, I've yet to see that be true anywhere that uh, government has ever done that. In fact, it seems to me that the state uh, really exists only to deprive people of those things. Uh, and, of course, if their big claim is that they're out there to protect you, 
then it's certainly uh, contradictory to that claim for them to threaten you uh, and demand that you pay them for services that you may not necessarily be interested in. Uh, so if I want protection, I'd, I'm willing to pay for that service, but I don't want them to put my friends in a cage for having a plant in their pocket or something like that. So you know, it's really it's really tough to opt out of the those things that uh, that we don't like that the state does. Now, this is a really fundamental concept. You're talking about uh, opting out. We're talking. We're going to talk about at the Zero Coming Zero Aggression Project the notion of conscience. The idea that if you your conscience says I shouldn't have to do this, you know, we have a long-standing tradition that's gradually evolved in this country uh, and in the Western world that we are supposed to respect rights of conscience. And yet, there are several things where that is not the case, where people are coerced to behave against their behavior by this entity that calls itself the government. Yeah, I mean, it's it's absolutely the case. I don't know what the Missouri state constitution looks like, but I know that here in New Hampshire, uh, the very first statement of the constitution has something to do with it, this all supposedly being by, by the consent of the governed. Uh, but I don't know about you, but I've tried to tell these government guys that I don't consent, and they just don't care. Uh, they, they just keep doing whatever it is they want to do, and I, that's really frustrating to me. You, you guys make five points in this declaration. We're really beginning to talk about number four on this list. Explicit voluntary association is the only means by which binding obligations may be created, and claims based on associational relationships to which any party did not consent are empty and invalid. Yeah, that's a reference to the much ballyhooed social contract, which, of course, the supporters of the state love to bring up uh, whenever you're questioning uh, the, the the status quo or the existing paradigm. Well, you, it's the social contract, blah, blah, blah. Well, where's the social contract? Please, can you show it to me? In fact, can you show me my signature on that social contract? Or do my parents get to sign me up for the social contract without my consent? Uh, and, you know, what are the terms in this social contract? It seems to me that the social contract is we, the state, do whatever the hell we want to do, and you'll pay for it. Period. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so, so, so that's the fourth point. Um, we're running short on time here, so I don't want to get you to have to interrupt you in the middle of this. I'm going to just uh, read a couple of these points, and then we'll take them when we come back, Ian. All right. First, each individual is the exclusive proprietor of his or her own existence and all products thereof, holding no obligations except those created by consent. There's that word consent again. Second, no individual or association of individuals, however constructed, or constituted, excuse me, has the right to initiate force against any other individual. That's the zero aggression principle we've been speaking of. Third, each individual has the inalienable right of self-defense against the initiation of force. We've covered number four. Number five is rights are neither collective nor additive in character, and no group can possess rights in excess of those belonging to individual members. That means being a member of a particular group doesn't make you special, uh, which is basically what the political class claims. Our number here, 573-874-9390-800-529-257, I'm sorry, 5572. Being joined by Ian Freeman, I'm Jim Babka filling in for Gary Nolan. You're locked in to the Gary Nolan Show. Okay, well, man, this show's gone fast, and it's gone easier than I thought it was going to go. I mean, I thought somebody was going to say that the things that we were discussing were too far out, too extreme, too radical, too crazy, uh, but they haven't. I mean, we've, every caller of this show has fundamentally agreed with the point. There's some fine details of how we go about fixing the problem that maybe we see a little bit differently, but everybody has said, look, it's, it's high time we have exactly the discussion that we've had today, whether or not things have gone too far in the state. Uh, deserves our allegiance at this point. Should should we be looking at Jefferson's remedy and saying maybe it's time to alter or abolish not not just tinker or reform this this thing that we call government? And I don't think it qualifies the government. I, as I said at the beginning of near the top of the show, I think we have what's called a state, which is an institution that has the believes it has a monopoly on the initiation of the use of force, and and. It's not a government. It can't be a government because governments are supposed to protect you from crime, not commit them. And this Snowden situation, to me, amongst a whole host of other things, illustrates you can't even tell the truth about crimes committed any longer without that itself being a crime. And everything's been criminalized. The treason, I mean, I'm sorry, the treason, the tyranny is obvious. 
someone that I know agrees with me on these points and is describing the Shire Society Declaration, his national radio talk show host, Ian Freeman, hosts the, hosts the show Free Talk Live that's on Monday through Saturday nights. You can listen in many markets all across the country or at freetalklive.com. Ian, welcome back. Hey, great to be here. Do we have Ian? Yep, I'm here. Oh, good, good. I didn't hear you the first time. Okay, okay let's go through these things here. Uh, each individual... Um, basically owns their bodies, I guess is what you're saying here, and their work product. Uh, well, yes. I, I mean, it seems like a pretty self-evident uh, idea that you own yourself. If uh, if somebody who's listening doesn't agree with that concept, there's really not much more that we can, we can talk about. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you trying to say that uh, they shouldn't be protected from the evils of big, bad pharmaceutical companies that want to sell them snake oil? Uh, well, and from getting those things? Well, okay, so the uh, you, know, you bring up uh, pharmaceuticals. I think it's it's pretty clear that uh, the FDA is is pretty much captured by pharmaceutical uh, companies, and uh, and they are essentially in existence to protect us from competition, uh, to protect us from anybody else stepping forward and and offering a, a valuable product or service that may, may may not have the billions of dollars to put the product uh, through their FDA process. So essentially, it it protects the existing. Uh, wealthy businessmen from competition from upstarts. Second, no individual or association of individuals, that would include something calling itself a government, however constituted, has the right to initiate force against any other individual. Yeah, uh, I mean, and that includes the people calling themselves the state. And ultimately, that's one of the big ideas I think we're trying to change here is people's uh, perception of what the state is. Uh, this, you know, this is a group of men and women. Most of them are strangers to you, unless you live in a really small town where you happen to know these people. But uh, in you know larger places, uh, you you probably don't know the people that call themselves the state, and they believe they have the right to use uh, the threat of force and actual force against you. And I'm not sure what it is that gives them that right, because I didn't uh, consent to allow them to do that to me. And so, therefore, they're just forcing themselves upon me like any other common gang, except this one, as uh, as Harry Brown, I think, put it way back in the day, uh, the libertarian presidential candidate uh, from the 1990s and, and 2000s, uh, you know, that, uh, that the government's just a, the most successful criminal gang. And you can the, the only difference between them and the mafia is they fly flags in front of their offices. You know, as someone, I, I want to know how much it matters that you actually know these people. Uh, you're in a town called Keene. People can see a lot of activism that you and your friends do at freekeen.com, I believe the website is. That's right. And, and, and you, you've actually engaged in, in demonstration. You've engaged in civil disobedience. Um, you, you really kind of tested the limits of the system in several ways up there. And that has led to you, even personally, spending time in jail does actually knowing the names of these people, kind of being on a first name with some of your oppressors, does that help? I think it does. Uh, so what you're referring to is uh, the Free State Project. That's the reason I live in, in Keene, New Hampshire. Uh, people are all across New Hampshire now. Over 1,000 people are here now as part of the Free State Project. Over 14,000 people are pledged to make the move here to New Hampshire. These are people like me and you, Jim, who actually care about freedom and who are willing to do something about it. I used to live in a place called Sarasota, Florida, which is a fairly populated area of uh, the west coast of Florida. Uh, and I think there's probably around 300,000 people that live in the county of Sarasota. But up here, there's maybe around 75,000 that live in Cheshire County, and about 25,000 of them live here in Keene. So it's a much smaller place. It's a much easier place to kind of uh, to make an impact and to, you know, to w- whatever your activism is, to have it be more effective uh, because you're in a smaller place. And that means you get to know these people that call themselves the state or you can get to know them. You know, the, the police department's so small that you might be able to know all of the officers on a, on a first name basis. I mean, we've got 40 uniformed cops here. They start, uh, in to, town. See you, they start to see you, Ian, as a human being, not just as a, as a Suspect. And vice versa, um, because when I was, you know, down in Florida, I couldn't have told you who all the cops were. There's hundreds of them down there, and uh, and they're a lot scarier down south as well. Up here, they tend to be a little bit more respecting of uh, of people's rights. I mean, they're still they're still hurting peaceful people and doing the wrong thing. Uh, but up here, you can connect with them on a more human level, and you can create relationships. And you know, when they're putting you in handcuffs, they're maybe more likely to not uh, st- cinch them down too tough. 
uptight. <laughs> you know, they're 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 more likely to be a little bit friendlier when they're oppressing you. And uh, I think that's worth something. I think that over the years, building relationships with these uh, these guys has been uh, there has been value there, definitely. You guys have taken a number of different actions to uh, stand up to the state. I'm going to talk in the in the final segment about downsize DC and what we're doing there, um, but. Uh, Tell me a little bit about you, the activity that you folks have engaged in in court. Um, number one, I know that in New Hampshire they just made uh, jury nullification legal. It, it, it was always le- truly moral and, and, and legal in the natural law sense, but they have actually made it part of the procedure in the New Hampshire court system. Uh, and that's a victory that you folks in the Free State Project have secured. But you guys have even gone further in terms of using this consent model to challenge the authority of the courts. Oh boy, I don't know where to begin on that question. I've spent so many hours in courtrooms, both on my own trials and observing and being a videographer for countless other uh, trials. Was there anything in particular you wanted me to focus on? Uh, let's, let's start with, let's start, this one is my favorite because it's so simple and symbolic. But my understanding is that uh, there was a decision that when courts were going to try people for nonviolent crimes, they hadn't actually hurt or harmed any other person in any way. Uh, they just had committed some crime that the state said they weren't allowed to do, maybe it was with their own body, that you folks would go in, initially it was only a couple of you, and when they said, all rise, and you weren't going to honor the court by following that instruction. And there yeah. was a response, but that changed over time. I'm interested in that story. Well, okay, so it depends on the courtroom. It depends on the, the judge. Uh, but, yeah, we've been uh, – activists up here for a long time have not been standing for uh, men in robes. And, uh, and, and that's not always true. You know, there are some people that do stand up for them, but the bulk of them, at least here in the Keene area, uh, won't stand up. I've been, in, I've been in courtrooms up here in New Hampshire – uh, specifically here in Keene, where they will, for instance, they'll call all their other cases uh, that that they have on the docket, and will the activists will just be sitting in there through all these cases, and then you know what they're they're trying to do is they're trying to get all the regular folks out of there, so the regular people won't be sitting there as audience members to watch what happens when they call the you know the Free State Project uh, participants up. So when they finally call the uh, the Free State case, or that judge walks in the room, but by the time the judge walks in the room, the whole room's empty. And uh, there's 20 people sitting in there that are all liberty activists, and not one of them stands for the judge. And the judge just ignores it and goes on uh, with you know with what he's doing. But for for somebody who's brand new, uh, this is a shocking experience. This is a an experience that is just mind boggling because you know everybody stands for the judge. I mean, everybody always stands for the judge. What they do on TV, it's you know exactly. Here's the point. It might seem minor. And initially it wasn't, by the way. You guys got, had some bailiffs that hustled you guys out and different stuff and threatened yeah. you with contempt of court, which gets you thrown in, in the hooskow for a while. Mm-hmm. You, you did all this. This may seem minor, and it may seem symbolic, but here's an example of exactly what we're talking about. When you make an internal decision that you no longer consent, and then you say, I'm going to begin having a conversation with others, and then enough others of you walk into a room and decide together, we're going to take an action. We now have numbers. Numbers is so important. Doing oh, yeah. the right thing at the right time does matter. You guys can get it, and now they're not even contesting it. They're not contesting the point any longer. Right. If this seems like a small thing to anybody listening, go ahead and try it and, uh, and <laughs> see how it see how it feels when you do it the first time. Boy, let me tell you, it is an adrenaline rush uh, to to just to simply stay seated. I mean, this is inaction uh, basically, but yet it's a pretty bold thing, and it's really interesting too. Uh, there have been some interesting scenes because not they don't always call our case last. Sometimes they'll call us first, and I don't understand why they do that because then it allows the people in the courtroom to see what's going on. Well, there's some cases where we'll have enough people sitting in the courtroom when the judge comes in that you can look around and watch the other people in the audience and. Like there are people there who I don't know who are clearly not part of the activist community who otherwise would likely stand for the judge. But when they observe that other people are staying seated, they will also stay seated. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, uh, we got about uh, a little, little over a minute just to go here. Um, I want to kind of wrap this up and talk about jury nullification as one of the possibilities that people can engage in. Yes. Ian, I believe that if one out of 12 people in this country would refuse to convict someone who convict, committed a nonviolent act. They didn't, they didn't do anything that actually harmed another person's property or life. If they uh, would have a suspicion that they can't trust federal agents, we didn't get a time to get into this NSA DEA story, mm-hmm. but if they would say that, you know, we now know it's on the record that agents, federal agents lie in court 
and in court documents and in court proceedings, and that's considered legal. Um, and so they would have give that those people when they testified the penalty of the doubt instead of the benefit of the doubt. Um, that we could change an awful lot in this country in a hurry, in a way that's very similar to you guys not standing up. Yeah, jury nullification is a really important idea. It's something you can do anywhere if you are on a jury or you have the chance to be on a jury. It's Please, don't get out of it. <laughs> don't try to avoid jury duty if you have a conscience and if you you know care about freedom. Because if you actually care about freedom and you're on somebody's jury, like, say, a drug case, a marijuana possession or something like that, or, or marijuana sales, you can vote not guilty because you think the law is bad. You, as a juror, are the final check and balance on an out-of-control system. And, of course, the court system doesn't want you to know that, which is why if you mention jury nullification uh, at any point, you'll probably be kicked off the jury. If you are a defendant and you mention jury nullification, you might get charged with contempt of court or a mistrial will be called. So the system everywhere is working to obscure the idea of jury nullification. It's a powerful concept. The folks over at the uh, Fully Informed Jury Association do a great job of explaining it in detail. Fija.org is their website, F-I-J-A. Dot org And up here in New Hampshire, we have our own New Hampshire kind of version of that where we do regular jury outreach. And as you mentioned, New Hampshire is the only state where it's actually enshrined in the law that the defendant has the right to explain explicitly what jury nullification is to the jury. Uh, that doesn't exist anywhere else. And that's because of Free State Project participants coming here and getting active. So would highly recommend people check that out. Ian, uh, rapid fire quick because we got to go to break. Yep. Uh, shameless plugs. Go. Oh, go, oh gosh. Freestateproject.org, probably the most important liberty movement of our lifetime. It's gathering thousands of people together here in New Hampshire and getting active so we can stand up for liberty together. Because as you said, numbers are what makes a huge difference. Um, you can also follow along with some of the stuff that's happening in New Hampshire by going to my blog site, which is freekeen.com. And if you want to sign that Shire Society declaration we were talking about or print it out for yourself and share it with people, you can go to shiresociety.com. And, of course, we can't leave out. Ian, thank you very much for being here. Free Talk Live, freetalklive.com. I've been a guest on that show several times, and uh, they provide a podcast if you can't listen live, but they're on in lots and lots of markets.